Welcome to the Political Podcast. I'm your host, Big Dorsey. And your co-host, David. And we have some special guests today. Now, here with us today are Lake and Gavin from the NWA. Now, tell me what the NWA stands for. New Winchester Academy. And, like, what, what, do, y'all, what do y'all do? Like, what do, you, what do you guys, what do you guys say, say? Like, what do you stand for? We talk about court cases that uh, do, do with the infringement of our First Ten Amendments, also known as the Bill of Rights. All right, that's nice. All right, so where, where exactly is the new Winchester Academy? We have no clue, like at all. Okay, like what do you, what do you mean you have no clue? So they tell us to meet up at a spot, and we go there in a black vehicle, pull up, usually a Yukon, and we'll get in, and you'll hear the gas start pumping in, and, um, Interesting. and you'll just pass out, and you wake up there, and your lab coat and everything's on. Oh, that's, that's nice. Yeah. Okay. So why did you say that you guys wear lab coats? Like, aren't you, aren't you like political people? We believe in equality. So we want everyone to be wearing the same thing and looking the same. Like, so it's not racist? Sure. Oh, I see. So I heard you guys talk about the Bill of Rights and stuff like that. So I guess that's what we're going to be doing today. So uh, where should we start? Um, we should probably start with like the First Amendment. Oh, you sure, you sure not, not the 12th? Well, I mean, we could start with the 12th, but I feel like going in order would be way better. Haha, <laughs> get pranked. It's not even in a Bill of Rights. New Winchester Academy, my butt. I, I do. Okay, so as Gavin said, we should probably start out with a First Amendment case. So here's your co-host, Dave, in with a First Amendment case. This case covers a 19-year-old department store worker, which expresses a opposition to the Vietnam War by wearing a jacket that said, F the draft and stop the war. The young man, Paul Cohen, was charged under a California statute that prohibits maliciously and loafing disturbing the peace and quiet of any neighborhood or person by offensive conduct. He was found guilty and sentenced to 30 days in jail. That does sound like something straight out of California, David. Thank you. Okay, Gavin, you're from the NWA, right? Yeah. I forgot. What does it stand for again? New Winchester Academy. And what do y'all do? We investigate court cases dealing with your Bill of Rights. All right, so you should know a lot about the First Amendment in this case, right? Yeah. All right, so ex- explain what was going on, like what, what they did wrong. All right, so basically, it was violating his First Amendment because they were trying to take away his freedom of expression. He was peacefully expressing his opinion by wearing a shirt saying F the draft and F the war. I don't agree with what you said, but explain why it's against his First Amendment rights. Well, I mean, he was expressing it peacefully. Maybe if he was like doing it violently, then it wouldn't be a violation of his First Amendment. But since he was doing it peacefully and no harm was being caused, there's no problem with it. All right, that's that's cool. All right, so let's move on to the Second Amendment case. All right, so here's David with your Second Amendment case called McDonald versus the city of Chicago. Okay, several suits were filed against Chicago and Oak Park in Illinois challenging their gun bans after the Supreme Court issued its uh, opinion on the Dis- District of Columbia versus Heller. In that case, the Supreme Court held that a District of Columbia handgun ban violated the Second Amendment. There, the court reasoned that the law in question was enacted under authority of the federal government, thus the Second Amendment was applicable. Here, plaintiffs argued that the Second Amendment should also apply to the states. The district court dismissed the suits on appeal. The U.S. Court Appeals for the Seventh Circuit affirmed. So basically, in simpler terms, the question is if the Second Amendment applies to the states because it's incorporated by the 14th Amendment's privileges and immunities or due process, due process clauses, thereby made applicable to the states. All right, so like we, re- we really usually don't go over these kind of things in this, this podcast. So like, can you make it a little bit more simple? Okay, so basically, the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution guarantees the right of people to keep and bear arms. This applies to state and local governments, as well as to the federal government. All right, so basically you're just saying that it's like, like if the Second Amendment applies to the states as well or something like that. Yeah. All right, so here's like trying to explain what Gavin said, to make it just a little bit more simple. Basically, there are a bunch of lawsuits 
um, on the city of Chicago for trying to get a man in trouble for owning a gun, even though that infringes the Second Amendment right to bear arms. And do you know, like, the current status of the case? It's still pending. All right, that's nice. So let's move on to the Third Amendment now, which is pretty much irrelevant now, because it was made for the Revolutionary War, and it was against the quartering of British troops, because they could basically come in and say, we need to stay at your house, we have no place to stay. And you had to let them in. And the, the Third Amendment was made, so you didn't have to let them in anymore, that you didn't have to have some guy that you don't know, a stranger danger, come into your house. And um, that's what it was created for. There hasn't been a case with that in a very, very long time since the Revolutionary War. So it's pretty much irrelevant today. It's not even worth going over anymore. Wonderful. Darn tootin', let's move on to the Fourth Amendment. Okay, so the Fourth Amendment is your freedom of search and seizure. So the, the police can't come into your house without a search warrant. Excuse you. Sorry, that was the NWA. Me and Gavin have to get back. Okay, they seem annoyed. Yeah, they're really wow. honest tonight, bro. Wow. Oh, man. Okay, so after two long months, Gavin and Lake are back from the NWA. So we have them back. We're going we're gonna to continue on with the podcast. All right, so where were we? Fourth Amendment, okay. So the Fourth Amendment is your freedom against unreasonable search and seizure. So Gavin, tell us more about that. So basically, they have to have like a true reason to search you. They can't just like pull nothing like out of thin air like, oh, your car is red, so we can search it. Or, like, so they can't just say, I don't like you, we're gonna search you? Yeah. Like for example, they can't search your car just cause you're black. Or like, uh, you know, like the stereotypes black people smoke weed and stuff. They can't just be like, you're black, you have weed. We gotta search your car. Okay, let's look into a case on that. And here's David with the case on the Fourth Amendment. During the early morning hours of October 30th, 1966, an individual approached an, a police officer in a gas station parking lot in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and informed him that another individual in a nearby vehicle was carrying narcotics and had a gun at his waist. The officer approached the vehicle on foot and asked the occupant, Robert Williams, to open the door. When Williams rolled down the window and said, the officer reached in the car and removed a gun from Williams' wristband, or waistband. Same thing. Though the gun was not visible from outside the vehicle. The officer then arrested Williams for unlawful possession of a firearm and proceeded to search his vehicle, where he found heroin. Williams was convicted in a Connecticut state court possession of a handgun and heroin. It sounds to me like it's a violation of your Second Amendment as well, because you're allowed to have concealed carry, and like it was concealed, you couldn't see it from outside. So I guess that's both. What exactly was like wrong with this? They didn't have a search warrant for his car and searched anyway, and that ended up they ended up finding narcotics. So like, I still don't get like what what what's actually wrong. Like, do you do you need a search warrant or something? They needed a search warrant for the specific thing they were trying to get him for, and they and ended up going without a search warrant and found narcotics, which put him away. Well, there you have it, guys. The NWA is smarter than a political podcast. Now we're on to the Fifth Amendment, which is the number after four, if you didn't know. What exactly is that, Gavin? So the Fifth Amendment is basically all your Miranda rights, which is like the police have to read you your rights after you get arrested. Like, you have the right to remain silent so you know that you ain't gotta tell them nothing because snitches go to jail. Oh, so that is that why they say I plead the fifth and stuff like that? Yeah, that's exactly why they say it. Oh, nice. So now, because we're very cool with the political podcast, we're gonna go over a case involving the Fifth Amendment. Okay. Uh, on March 13, 1963, Ernesto Miranda was arrested in his house and brought to the police station where he was questioned by police officers in connection with the kidnapping and rape. After two hours of interrogation, the police obtained a written confession from Miranda. Is that why it's called the Miranda Rights? I don't know, maybe. The written confession was admitted into evidence at trial despite the objection of the defense attorney and the fact that police officers admitted that they had not advised Miranda of his right to have an attorney present during the inter interrogation. The jury found Miranda guilty. On appeal, the Supreme Court of Arizona affirmed and held that Miranda's constitutional rights were not violated because he did not specifically request counsel. Nice. 
Hey, Gavin, you're from the NWA, right? Yeah. What's that stand for again? New Winchester Academy. You sure? Yep. Okay. Cool. So, so you should know a lot about this, right? Yeah, I do, actually. Explain. So basically, Daniel Reed, the guy that writes, to, tells him that he doesn't have to tell them anything, that he could get an attorney, that he doesn't have to, like, a deal. He just fell over. It's okay. I guess that concludes your Fifth Amendment. Let's move on to the Sixth. Now, what is the Sixth, David? The Sixth Amendment guarantees the rights of criminal defendants. Nice. I can't lie, this podcast would be pretty freaking boring if we didn't talk about really cool things. And you know what's a really cool thing? The Sixth Amendment. And we should talk about a case with the Sixth Amendment. Here's David with that. Okay, this case says... Clarence Earl Gideon was charged in Florida State Court with a felony of breaking and entering. When he breaking and entering what? Uh, I don't know. It doesn't say. Cool. When he appeared in court without a lawyer, Gideon requested that the court appoint one for him. According to Florida state law, however, an attorney may only be appointed to an indigenous defendant in capital cases, so the trial court did not appoint one. Gideon represented himself in trial. He was found guilty and sentenced to five years in prison. Gideon filed a habeas corpus petition in the Florida Supreme Court, arguing <laughs> that word. He, just, he also just fell over, so I'm got, he's, he's not doing too well on the floor right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue reading. Arguing that the court trial decision violated his constitutional right to be represented by counsel. The Florida Supreme Court denied the habeas corpus relief. Wow. I'm kind of confused. What's that mean? It's the right to an attorney. Um, is, is there anything else? Nah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm guessing that's the end of the Sixth Amendment. So let's move on to the Seventh. So now we move on to the Seventh Amendment, which is the right to a jury. David, can you explain us a case? Sure. Okay, this case says, in 1991, Columbia Pictures Television, Inc. terminated agreements licensing several television series, including Who's the Boss and Silver Spoons, Heart to Heart, and T.J. Hooker. To three... <laughs> The three television stations owned by C. Elvin Feltner after the station's royalty payments became delinquent. Columbia sued Feltner after his stations continued to broadcast the programs for copyright infringement. After winning partial summary judgment as to liability on its copyright infringement claims, Columbia attempted to recover statutory damages under Section 504C of the Copyright Act. The district court denied Filter's request for a jury trial and awarded Columbia statutory damages following a bench trial. After affirming, the Court of Appeals held that neither Section 504C nor the Seventh Amendment provides, provides a right of jury or trial on statutory damages. Cool. You're from the NWA, right, Lake? Correct. What's that stand for again? New. That gas getting into your head now, isn't it? Yeah. It's the New, New Winchester, Winchester Academy. Yeah. New Winchester Academy. That gas doesn't run off from earlier. Okay. So, you should know a lot about this, right? Correct. Explain. So, the Seventh Amendment gives you a right to a jury for your trial. And basically that whole thing was about them trying to deny a person the jury. Sick. So I guess that that's the end of the Seventh Amendment. Let's move on to the Eighth Amendment. The Eighth Amendment covers your right to no excessive bail and no cruel or unusual punishments or no excessive fines imposed. This basically means that if they try and be all extra about things, be like, no, you owe me four million for my stub toe. You'd be like, 
Nah, bro. That's not how it works. Yes. Okay, so it seems that my guy Dave is back on the floor. He fell again. Freaking clumsy fart. Okay, so I'm gonna read this one. It's called Estelle versus Barefoot. On November 14th, 1978, a Texas jury in Bell County found Thomas A. Barefoot, he got a special name, guilty of the murder of a police officer. A separate sentencing hearing was held before the same jury to determine whether the death penalty, the bet, can I get a I mean, I mean, <laughs> as I was saying, a separate sentencing hearing was held before the same jury to determine whether the death penalty should be imposed. The prosecution called two psychiatrists to the stand who testified that Barefoot was likely to commit further acts of violence and would remain a danger to society. The jury sentenced Barefoot to death. Barefoot appealed to the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals and argued that the use of psychiatrists The use of psychiatrists to testify is a further con- This is why you're supposed to read, David, but you're over here on the floor. Uh, I'm crippled. Yeah, I can tell. Bro's like laid out like freaking five pieces. Uh, all right, all right. What? You can, can't you see him on the floor freaking crippled as crap right now? Yeah. Bruh. Okay, Barefoot appealed to the Texas court criminal jury Crim no, criminal appeals and argued that the use of psychiatrists to testify as to further conduct was unconstitutional because psychiatrist testimony cannot accurately predict future dangerousness and is likely to produce erroneous convictions. He also argued that this specific testimony was unconstitutional as neither psychiatrist had personally examined Barefoot. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed the conviction and sentence. Barefoot's execution was scheduled for September 7th, 1980. A stay of execution was granted by the Supreme Court pending the filing and disposition of a petition of certiorari. That's a weird word. The petition was denied, and Barefoot's execution was rescheduled for October 1981. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals denied Barefoot's application for habeas corpus, and he filed a petition for habeas corpus in district court. The district court granted a stay of execution pending action on the petition, and later denied that petition and vacated the stay of execution. The district court also issued a certificate of probable cause that would allow Barefoot to continue the appeals process. The Texas Court of Criminal Appeals again denied Barefoot's petition for habeas corpus and motion for a stay of execution. Barefoot appealed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 5th District for a stay of execution pending the consideration of his appeal for the denial of his petition for habeas corpus and the court of appeals denied the motion i don't get that gavin can you explain so basically they didn't give him a fair trial because they used a bunch of psychiatrists against him and they also gave him a cruel and unusual punishment for the little crime he committed okay so like did they give him that cruel and unusual punishment like because he didn't have a fair trial Yes, yes they did. Oh, I understand now. That's super cool. That will conclude the Eighth Amendment. Let's move on to the Ninth. The Ninth Amendment states that people have rights that are not specifically said in the Constitution. It's like your basic rights, like like just things that, that are like common sense. Obviously your rights, like your right to walk around, your right to have two legs, your right to have two arms, your right to have two eyes, your right to have two nostrils, etc. Like, like stuff like that. And here's Davin to read about a case from the Ninth Amendment. Okay, in 1940, Congress enacted the Hatch Act, which made it illegal for any officer or employee of the executive branch of the federal government to take an active role in political management or political campaigns. The appellants sued the members of the United States Civil Service Commission responsible for enforcing the Hatch Act 
and sought an injunction against the enforcement of the provisions of the act regulating political action. They argued that the section of the act was unconstitutional. Now that appeals with the exception of sec excess he just fell on the floor again. I'm gonna continue where Davin left off because he fell on the floor and he's still there. Um, with the exception of George Poole, we're facing disciplinary action for violating the act. The district court held the section in question for constitutional and granted summary judgment in favor of the appellees. Or appellees. That's a weird word. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court, but the appeal was not doc docketed until more than 60 days after the appeal was allowed. The, the appellees argued that because the proper appeals process was not followed, the Supreme Court did not have jurisdiction over the case. I did not understand a word of that. What's that mean? It was said that the Hatch Act restricted the rights of government employees. Okay. So that's like they're not the amendment rights, I'm guessing? Yeah. Okay, cool. Now that we're done with the ninth, it's about time to move on to the 10th Amendment, the, the final amendment of the Bill of Rights. I actually don't know the 10th Amendment. Gavin, you're from the NWA, right? Yeah. What's that stand for? New Winchester Academy. So you should know about the 10th Amendment, right? Yep. What's the 10th Amendment? So basically, it's federalism. The states have their own rights, and the government also has their own rights, like the whole country. I see. <laughs> David is back up off the floor, so he's going to tell you about our 10th Amendment case. Okay, Carol Ann Bond was found guilty trying to poison her husband's mistress, Marengla Haynes, with the toxic chemicals that's at least 24 times over the course of several months. The grand jury in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania charged Bond with two counts of possessing and using a chemical weapon in violation of a criminal statute implementing the Treaty of Obligations of the United States under 1993 Chemical Weapons Convention. The grand jury also charged Bond with two accounts of mail theft. Bond's attorney argued that the statute was intended to deal with rogue states and, ter and terrorists and that their client should have been prosecuted under state law instead. Bond, a laboratory technician, stole the chemical potassium dichromate from the company where he worked, or where she worked. Uh, Haynes was not injured. Bond's husband had a child with Haynes while married to Bond. Haynes was con had contacted police and postal authorities after finding chemicals at her home. In September 2009, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit held that Bond lacked standing challenge to constitutionality of the statute on the basis of the Tenth Amendment. Cool. I don't get it. Gavin, you're from the NWA, right? Yeah. What's that stand for? New Winchester Academy. So you should know a lot about this, right? Yes, sir. Explain. So basically, they were trying to make it a federal case. Whenever it was just a state case. So they were like saying it was like a big old federal crime, but it was just it was just a little little state state problem. Pretty much. Nice. That concludes this episode of the Political Podcast. For more, too bad. This is the only one. Ha <laughs> ha.